by looking at some of the poetry of the 1850s. In the year 1850, neatly at the midpoint of the century and of this series, two long poems were published for the first time. Poems which had been completed earlier after much drafting and redrafting over the years. One was The Prelude, published by Wordsworth's widow, Mary, in the year of his death. The other was Tennyson's In Memoriam, published in the year Tennyson succeeded Wordsworth as Poet Laureate. 1850, then, is marked by two very substantial monuments. But their initial reception was very different. In Memoriam, though it was first published anonymously, was almost immediately revealed as being by Tennyson, and was instantly a critical and commercial success, going into three editions in three months. The Prelude was another matter. Its full title carried with it as subtitles the two names by which Wordsworth had known it during his lifetime, The Growth of a Poet's Mind, an autobiographical poem. He'd finished it 45 years earlier, in 1805, and had gone back to it and tinkered with it ever afterwards. Now, here it was, shown to the public for the first time a couple of months after his death. By now, that public thought it knew his work. Wordsworth had many admirers and some detractors too. The new book was ignored by some parts of the periodical press, treated skimpily in others, praised in only a few. It took years to become recognised for what it is, the summation of a great poet's work. Here, then, is part of Book One of the Prelude, in the version first published in 1850. Fair seed time had my soul, and I grew up fostered alike by beauty and by fear, much favoured in my birthplace, and no less in that beloved vale to which ere long we were transplanted. There were we let loose for sports of wider range. Ere I had told ten birthdays, when among the mountain slopes, frost and the breath of frosty wind had snapped the last autumnal crocus, Twas my joy, with store of springes o'er my shoulder hung, to range the open heights where woodcocks run among the smooth green turf. Through half the night, scudding away from snare to snare, I plied that anxious visitation. Moon and stars were shining o'er my head. I was alone, and seemed to be a trouble to the peace that dwelt among them. Sometimes it befell in these night wanderings that a strong desire o'erpowered my better reason, and the bird which was the captive of another's toil became my prey. And when the deed was done, I heard among the solitary hills low breathings coming after me, and sounds of undistinguishable motion, steps almost as silent as the turf they trod. Nor less, when spring had warmed the cultured vale, roved we as plunderers where the mother bird had in high places built her lodge. Though mean our object and inglorious, yet the end was not ignoble. Oh, when I have hung above the raven's nest, by knots of grass and half-inch thistles in the slippery rock but ill-sustained, and almost so it seemed suspended by the blast that blew amain, shouldering the naked crag, oh, at that time, while on the perilous ridge I hung alone, with what strange utterance did the loud, dry wind blow through my ear. The sky seemed not a sky of earth, and with what motion moved the clouds. In Memoriam has been variously described. Elegy, of course, but also diary, extended lyric, religious meditation. I think it encompasses all these. Its 133 unequal sections, including its prologue and epilogue, for all the binding unity of the A, B, B, A quatrain form, have an extraordinary range. To choose one section for this program has been difficult. I've settled on 101, in which the emphasis is perhaps on the minute particulars of the myopic Tennyson, rather than on his more panoptic pronouncements on what a modern critic has called immortality, geology, evolution, theology, poetry, the relation of man to nature, the future of England. Unwatched, 
The garden boughs shall sway, the tender blossom flutter down. Unloved, that beech will gather brown, this maple burn itself away. Unloved, the sunflower shining fair, ray round with flames her disk of seed, and many a rose carnation feed with summer spice the humming air. Unloved by many a sandy bar, the brook shall babble down the plain. At noon, or when the lesser wane is twisting round the polar star. Uncared for, gird the windy grove and flood the haunts of hern and crake, or into silver arrows break the sailing moon in creek and cove. Till from the garden and the wild a fresh association blow, and year by year the landscape grow familiar to the stranger's child. As year by year the labourer tills his wonted glebe or lops the glades, and year by year our memory fades from all the circle of the hills. The two-volume work which Browning published in 1855 was called Men and Women, a title which he later limited to a dozen or so poems, including some which I'd very much like to have used, but which are too long for present purposes such as How It Strikes a Contemporary and Bishop Blougram's Apology. The 1855 Men and Women include several which Browning came to group under dramatic lyrics and dramatic romances. From them all, I've chosen one of the shortest, partly because it memorably spans the decades of the century with which this series is concerned. Memorabilia by Robert Browning. Ah, did you once see Shelley Plain? And did he stop and speak to you? And did you speak to him again? How strange it seems, and new. But you were living before that, and also you are living after. And the memory I started at, my starting moves your laughter. I crossed a moor with a name of its own, and a certain use in the world, no doubt. Yet a hand's breadth of it shines alone, with the blank miles round about. For there I picked up on the heather, and there I put inside my breast a moulted feather, an eagle feather. Well, I forget the rest. Two years later, Browning's wife, Elizabeth Barrett, published a long poem which had far more immediate impact and success than men and women. This romance or novel in blank verse was passionately admired by, among others, Ruskin, Landor, Rossetti and Swinburne. It was also controversial, mainly because it dealt so forcefully with what at the time was called the woman question. Now, in our own time, after many years of Aurora Lee being neglected and unread, that same woman question has begun to bring it back into circulation. But its interest and power go well beyond that point. I've chosen from it part of Book Five, an eloquent and witty treatment of the poet's subject matter, how much it can draw on the past and neglect the present. Part of Elizabeth Barrett Browning's Aurora Lee. The critics say that epics have died out with Agamemnon and the goat-nursed gods. I'll not believe it. I could never deem, as Payne Knight did, the mythic mountaineer who travelled higher than he was born to live and showed sometimes the goiter in his throat, discoursing of an image seen through fog, that Homer's heroes measured twelve feet high. They were but men. His Helen's hair turned grey like any plain Miss Smith's who wears a front, and Hector's infant whimpered at a plume as yours last Friday at a turkey cock. All actual heroes are essential men, and all men possible heroes. Every age, heroic in proportions, double-faced, looks backward and before, expects a morn and claims an epos. Aye, but every age appears to souls who live in it, ask Carlyle, most unheroic. Ours, for instance, ours. The thinkers scout it, and the poets abound who scorn to touch it with a fingertip. A pewter age, mixed metal, silver-washed, an age of scum, spooned off the richer past. 
an age of mere transition, meaning naught except that what succeeds must shame it quite, if God please. That's wrong thinking, to my mind, and wrong thoughts make poor poems. Every age, through being beheld too close, is ill-discerned by those who have not lived past it. We'll suppose Mount Athos carved, as Alexander schemed, to some colossal statue of a man. The peasants, gathering brushwood in his ear, had guessed as little as the browsing goats of form or feature of humanity up there. In fact, had travelled five miles off or ere the giant image broke on them, full human profile, nose and chin distinct, mouth muttering rhythms of silence up the sky, and fed at evening with the blood of suns, grand torso, hand that flung perpetually the largesse of a silver river down to all the country pastures. Tis even thus with times we live in, evermore too great to be apprehended near. But poets should exert a double vision, should have eyes to see near things as comprehensively as if afar they took their point of sight, and distant things as intimately deep as if they touched them. Let us strive for this. I do distrust the poet who discerns no character or glory in his times, and trundles back his soul five hundred years past moat and drawbridge into a castle court to sing, oh, not of lizard or of toad alive at the ditch there, twere excusable, but of some black chief, half knight, half sheep lifter, some beauteous dame, half chattel and half queen. As dead as must be, for the greater part, the poems made on their chivalric bones, and that's no wonder, death, inherits death. Nay, if there's room for poets in this world, a little overgrown, I think there is. Their sole work is to represent the age, their age, not Charlemagne's, this live, throbbing age that brawls, cheats, maddens, calculates, aspires, and spends more passion, more heroic heat betwixt the mirrors of its drawing rooms than Roland with his knights at Roncesvalles. To flinch from modern varnish, coat or flounce, cry out for togas and the picturesque, is fatal. Foolish, too. King Arthur's self was commonplace to Lady Guinevere, and Camelot to minstrels seemed as flat as Fleet Street to our poet. Well, Matthew Arnold is unlikely to have been in her mind when she wrote that. It sounds more like a swipe at Tennyson's Idylls of the King. She may have managed to hear or read something of them before they were published in 1859, and certainly when they were published, she wrote that they left me cold. But Matthew Arnold, too, was burrowing into the past. His Saurab and Rustam is a small-scale epic drawing on an old Persian legend about a warrior father unknowingly killing his warrior son. For me, it takes off and becomes something other than stately literary decorum in its closing passage. Here are the last thirty-five or so lines of Sorab and Rustam. So on the bloody sand Sorab lay dead, and the great Rustam drew his horseman's cloak down on his face and sat by his dead son. As those black granite pillars, once high reared by Jemshid in Persepolis, to bear his house, now mid their broken flights of steps lie prone, enormous down the mountainside. So in the sand lay Rustum by his son. And night came down over the solemn waste, and the two gazing hosts, and that sole pair, and darkened all and a cold fog with night crept from the oxus. Soon a hum arose, as of a great assembly loosed, and fires began to twinkle through the fog, for now both armies moved to camp and took their meal. The Persians took it on the open sands southward, the Tartars by the river Marge, and Rustum and his son were left alone. But the majestic river floated on, 
Out of the mist and hum of that lowland, into the frosty starlight, and there moved rejoicing through the hushed Chorasmian waste, under the solitary moon. He flowed right for the polar star past Organje, brimming and bright and large. Then sands begin to hem his watery march and dam his streams and split his currents. That for many a league the shorn and parceled oxus strains along through beds of sand and matted rushy isles. Oxus, forgetting the bright speed he had in his high mountain cradle in Pamir, a foiled, circuitous wanderer. Till at last the longed-for dash of waves is heard. And wide his luminous home of waters opens, bright and tranquil, from whose floor the new-bathed stars emerge and shine upon the Aral Sea. But, as Elizabeth Browning noted with some asperity, there was a modern world which poets ought not to neglect. Someone who didn't neglect it was Arthur Hugh Clough. He'd been in Rome on holiday in the spring of 1849, at the time of the war between the new Roman Republic under Mazzini and the French, who invaded the city in an attempt to reinstate the banished Pope. Clough was then thirty, and it's tempting to think of his Amour de Voyage, written a few years later, as being not only a novel in verse, but an autobiographical novel. He denied the suggestion emphatically with the words, Extremely not so. Whatever the truth, here is a section from that poem in which Claude, the central character, is writing to his friend Eustace, after an incident he characteristically describes in his wry, slightly supercilious, but also slightly shocked fashion. The meter, English hexameters, seems just right, both fluent and shapely. So I have seen a man killed, and experienced that, among others. Yes, I suppose I have, although I can hardly be certain, and in a court of justice could never declare I had seen it. But a man was killed, I am told. In a place where I saw something, a man was killed, I am told. And I saw something. I was returning home from St. Peter's. Murray, as usual, under my arm, I remember, had crossed the St. Angelo Bridge and, moving towards the Condotti, had got to the first barricade when, gradually, thinking still of St. Peter's, I became conscious of a sensation of movement opposing me, tendency this way, such as one fancies may be in a stream when the wave of the tide is coming and not yet come, a sort of poise and retention. So I turned, and before I turned, caught sight of stragglers heading a crowd, it is plain, that is coming behind that corner. Looking up, I see windows filled with heads. The piazza into which you remember the Ponte St. Angelo enters, since I passed, has thickened with curious groups. And now the crowd is coming, has turned, has crossed that last barricade, is here at my side. In the middle they drag at something. What is it? Ah, bare swords in the air, held up. There seem to be voices pleading and hands putting back. Official, perhaps, but the swords are many and bare in the air. In the air they descend, they are smiting, hewing, chopping. At what? In the air once more, upstretched and... Is it blood that's on them? Yes, certainly blood. Of whom, then? Over whom is the cry of this furor of exaltation? While they are skipping and screaming and dancing their caps on the points of swords and bayonets, I to the outskirts back and ask a mercantile-seeming bystander, What is it? And he, looking always that way, makes me answer, A priest who is trying to fly to the Neapolitan army, and thus explains the proceeding. You didn't see the dead man? No. I began to be doubtful. I was in black myself and didn't know what mightn't happen. But a National Guard close by me, outside of the hubbub, broke his sword with slashing a broad hat covered with dust and passing away from the place with Murray under my arm and stooping, I saw through the legs of the people the legs of a body. You are the first, you know, to whom I have mentioned the matter. Whom should I tell it to else? These girls? The heavens forbid it. Quidnooks of Monaldinis? Idlers upon the Pincian? If I rightly remember, it happened on that afternoon when word of the nearer approach of a new Neapolitan army first was spread. I began to bethink me of Paris Septembers. Thought I could fancy the look of that old 92. 
On that evening, three or four, or it may be five of these people were slaughtered. Some declared they had one of them fired on a sentinel. Others say they were only escaping. A priest, it is currently stated, stabbed a national guard on the very Piazza Colonna. History, rumor of rumors, I leave it to thee to determine. But I am thankful to say the government seems to have strength to put it down. It has vanished, at least. The place is most peaceful. Through the Trastevere walking last night at nine of the clock, I found no sort of disorder. I crossed by the island bridges, so by the narrow streets to the Ponte Rotto, and onwards thence by the Temple of Vesta, away to the great Colosseum, which, at the full of the moon, is an object worthy a visit. A few years before Amour de Voyage was published, in an American periodical, incidentally, the Atlantic Monthly, though Clough was, of course, English, a 37-year-old American who had variously been a printer, schoolteacher, shopkeeper and local newspaper editor published at his own expense and anonymously a 95-page book called Leaves of Grass. He also managed to review it himself, again anonymously, in three separate papers. Immodest, you may say, and modesty wasn't one of Walt Whitman's virtues. Here, indeed, was a new voice. And here are the first lines of the first published version of his Song of Myself. I celebrate myself and sing myself, and what I assume you shall assume, for every atom belonging to me as good belongs to you. I loaf and invite my soul. I lean and loaf at my ease, observing a spear of summer grass. My tongue, every atom of my blood, formed from this soil, this air, born here of parents, born here from parents the same, and their parents the same. I, now thirty-seven years old, in perfect health, begin, hoping to cease not till death. Creeds and schools in abeyance, retiring back a while, sufficed at what they are, but never forgotten, I harbour for good or bad. I permit to speak at every hazard, nature without check, with original energy. Houses and rooms are full of perfumes. The shelves are crowded with perfumes. I breathe the fragrance myself and know it and like it. The distillation would intoxicate me also, but I shall not let it. The atmosphere is not a perfume. It has no taste of the distillation. It is odorless. It is for my mouth forever. I am in love with it. I will go to the bank by the wood and become undisguised and naked. I am mad for it to be in contact with me. The smoke of my own breath. Echoes, ripples, buzzed whispers, love root, silk thread, crotch and vine. My respiration and inspiration, the beating of my heart, the passing of blood and air through my lungs, the sniff of green leaves and dry leaves, and of the shore and dark-coloured sea rocks, and of hay in the barn. The sound of the belched words of my voice loosed to the eddies of the wind, a few light kisses, a few embraces, a reaching around of arms, the play of shine and shade on the trees as the supple boughs wag, the delight, alone or in the rush of the streets or along the fields and hillsides. The feeling of health, the full noon trill, the song of me, rising from bed and meeting the sun. 